Welcome all of you. I hope you're all staying uh, safe and washing your hands a lot. Um, so today I'm going to be answering a question that came into the group about um, <clears throat> from a husband who has been <clears throat> feeling never desired or chosen in his marriage. And I'm going to just read his question and then respond to it. <clears throat> this is his question. He says, my wife and I have been married for over 20 years and pretty much the entire marriage has been about duty sex for her. I came forward with some pretty serious betrayal three years ago that we are still working through and will still take time. I know duty sex is not really beneficial for either spouse. It leaves me unfulfilled and her feeling obligated and there doesn't seem to be an end of this type of sex in sight. I either take duty sex or I go without. I really want to be physically intimate and emotionally vulnerable and connected during sex, but she's not able or willing to try for that. Okay, so my question is, do I take what I can get and feel guilty and selfish, or should I just forget about sex and hope someday things change? We see a female sex therapist who's trying to challenge my wife without much success. We have an agreement that I can masturbate when I want without porn, but that's really not that fulfilling when it's the main source of sexual release. I've tried to share Jennifer's materials and other similar materials, but she's not ready and says she may not be for years, if ever. Am I better off refusing duty sex until maybe something changes? <clears throat> How long should I be expected to go without meaningful sex? I don't want to be selfish about sex. I want it to be something special and connecting. So, okay, so let me just kind of <clears throat> pull some of these questions apart and, and uh, give my response to them. First, I think something that's really challenging about being the higher desire person is <clears throat> that it can feel so much like a powerless position because you can't make someone want you and you can't make someone desire you. And so that <clears throat> reality can make you feel profoundly frustrated and I think will challenge your sense of self very much, right? Because what is so special about being wanted and desired is that it's not something you make happen. It, it's a grace in a sense. And so that's why it has so much meaning and significance to us as it's just being offered to us. <clears throat> and before I jump into the specifics of this question, you know, people will do all kinds of things to pressure their spouse to want them um, or to have sex with them at least because a lot of us want that sexual validation <clears throat> rather than tolerate the lack of control in that reality. And so um, Ruby sent me a really funny graphic and Ruby, if you're able to post it, maybe try, but <laughs> he sent me an image today of supposedly Wolf Blitzer on CNN reporting that constant sex is a way to overcome the coronavirus if you're having sex constantly. Now, it <clears throat> turns out that this is a hoax that Wolf Blitzer never said this, um, but it kind of speaks to what a lot of us do. Um, that is to say we come up with ideas like, hey, healthy couples are having sex three times a week, or I need this, or if I'm not going to look at porn, you need to be available. And so we'll do a lot of things often to manipulate our spouse into being sexual with us. Um, and if fending off coronavirus is a strategy you want to try, um, okay. But of course, the cost for this is that, yeah, thanks, Ruby. Uh, the cost for this is that you may get sex, but you still don't get what most people want, which is to be desired and to uh, have a spouse who feels passionate about being close to you and close to you sexually and that's not something you can make someone do now the only thing that you do have control over is whether or not you continue to participate in a marriage where you're not wanted or chosen okay but but I think a smarter thing to start with is how have I participated um, in not being a desirable person or participated in a dynamic where I don't have to be chosen, uh, where being chosen is optional in a sense in this marriage. And so, <clears throat> so let me just think through that with you because of course these things are often multiply determined. It's seldom 
I mean, I don't think it's ever been as a therapist that just one person is doing something that's part of the problem. Usually couples work out ways to um, have these problems stay stable because they're each participating in their role in this troubling dynamic. And so the only thing you can do is deal with your half of this. Okay, so, so let me go through the question, take it apart a little bit and look at um, the, sorry, I'm just gonna sit up a little bit higher. Look at um, both what the husband, in this case it's a husband, may be doing um, and what the wife, the lower desire person, may be contributing. So let me just go back through. He says, my wife and I have been married for over 20 years. Pretty much the entire marriage has been about duty sex for her. I came forward with some pretty serious betrayal three years ago and we are still working through that and it will take time. So the first question for me would be, why has it always been about duty sex? Um, what is that about? Sorry, I'm gonna try and prop this a little differently. Working from my phone is not my favorite thing. Um, okay. Um, okay, <laughs> there we go. So, um, so I would wanna know if I were working with this couple, why has it always been about duty sex? Because there's, there's at least a couple hypotheses that come to mind for me that I would wanna be sorting through. And of course, it could be one or the other, it could be both of these things on some level. So, uh, and then, so how is it always about duty sex and how does this couple make sense of the betrayal? Those are both pretty significant questions for me in discerning where the solution may lie in this. Um, um, so what does the betrayal say about the husband and what does it say about how the couple has functioned? Uh, so for example, it could be that the wife has never wanted to choose the spouse. So a lot of people, want to be wanted and desired and, and sexually pursued even. Uh, they want the clarity that they are desirable, but they don't necessarily want to lean in and choose a spouse and, um, and choose them wholeheartedly and choose them sexually. And um, this is kind of a role that we give to women culturally Women out there that are the higher desire partners often are partnered with somebody that they can't they can't quite get the sense that their spouse chooses them, wants them. That, so often the higher desire is driven by the fact that you're in pursuit of sexual validation. You're in pursuit of the idea that you are considered desirable. And so, um, you know, women who are higher desire are often partnered with some, a lower desire husband who they, they, they're seeking that acknowledgement and that um, evidence that they're considered sexually desirable. So that's why these high low dynamics will emerge. This is really the thinking of Dr. David Schnarch who talks about this um, in, I know he talks about it in his book, Desire and Intimacy, but also probably. Um, so you know, so these d dynamics often emerge around the issues of validation. So what I'm interested in in this particular question is why was it from the beginning a accommodation-based sexual relationship? So how much was it about that the wife didn't really want to choose and didn't maybe have her own relationship to her sexuality worked out, didn't really wanted to do the marriage in a way that culturally she'd been taught to do it, but wasn't really stepping in to create a partnership. And then the husband resentfully goes along with that and keeps um, tolerating, in a sense, not being chosen, even though he may be operating as a choosable good partner, but keeps accepting that she's not gonna lean in and really make him a priority. Um, but here's the key thing that he is operating in a, in a desirable, choosable way. She just doesn't want to grow up and that his limitation in this is that he keeps accepting it, that he keeps, um, thinking that at some point she will, or that you can't expect more of a woman and be a good man. And possibly then his resentment about that, his... Um, quiet like stuffing of his anger about that turns into that the, the desire of another person or I don't know what the betrayal exactly was but you know the, the possible validation of another person becomes 
compelling enough for him and he has enough resentment built up that this becomes his choice. And if that's the right picture, I don't know that it is because I have another picture or two involved in my mind, uh, that <clears throat> this can now kind of be the perfect way for the lower desire wife to not deal with the issues of her sexuality and her ability to choose her spouse because now she has some victim status and she can use the idea that, um, you know, he's the bad husband that she's now justified in not choosing. And so because she's suffering from, you know, that betrayal, she's not got anything to promise him. And it sounds like that's at least partly how it's getting put together based on how he's putting this. The other possibility, let me just throw out um, um, another possibility. And, you know, these can both be operating on some level in any given dynamic. But I think that the other possibility is that the wife didn't necessarily have issues with her sexuality or maybe <clears throat> was, wasn't so much reluctant to choose her husband but that he was operating in a kind of entitled way from the beginning, that sex was really about him and getting the sexual validation he felt he deserved. And that maybe she wanted to have good sex and wanted to lean in, but leaning into this kind of entitlement is very hard to do. I, I don't mean that one should do it. Um, it's not desirable. It means that if I am sexual and choose you, I kind of lose myself in a sense because it's all about propping up your ego and your sexuality. And that's not fun for me. So it's not that I don't like sex, it's that I don't like this kind of sex and I don't like this kind of meaning. And so now what a lot of people do when they're in that situation, they don't necessarily know how to address it. They don't kind of want the mess of trying to address it. They may have their own self-doubt about whether or not it's legitimate for them to stand up for something better for themselves. Um, and so they may quietly just accommodate, but not really address the dynamic in the marriage and, and make it better. And so, um, and then he may, out of his entitlement, go and have the affair uh, that was already kind of operating in the marriage and part of her low desire. And she may then continue to have low desire, but more out of um, some good judgment in a sense, like I don't like who you are and I don't necessarily want a divorce and, and you know, maybe I'll do enough that this marriage doesn't blow up, but I don't really want you. And that's the truth of it. So, um, okay, I have no fever, just to, <laughs> you don't blow my nose. Okay, so. Not that you can catch it through Facebook Live. Okay, so um, so I think that's just a really important question. And, and speaking to the husband more directly <clears throat> around this is I would ask, you know, what, first of all, why do you think you have tolerated, and I'm not saying this like poor you, but why have you participated in being related to from a duty position? And this is a really important question because First of all, um, is it your own difficulty validating your desirability, which I think it is, okay? And then why do you have difficulty validating your desirability? Is it because you function in ways that you know are not very desirable and you know a woman in good judgment wouldn't want? Have you addressed the issues in yourself that were a part of your infidelity and you know you're operating from a desirable position in a way that it would be safe for her to lean into you, open up to you, but she just chooses not to? Or are those issues still unaddressed, right? Because <clears throat> a lot of people want the idea that time will heal things, okay? That's not really my experience, especially in the intimacy of marriage. It's not time that heals things, it's addressing things that heals things. And so is your wife reluctant to open up to you because the fundamental issues within you have not yet been sufficiently addressed? Or is she just using the idea of I am hurt to not have to deal with herself in creating a better marriage? And um, this is can be a risk sometimes in talking to people about betrayal trauma and 
their sense of disillusionment is that's all true and that's important uh, to understand. But is it a kind of waking up that allows people to move forward and not just get stuck in a kind of helpless victim position? It's very, very important for people being able to bring their strength to create something better in their lives, whether that's in their marriage to make something function better or they uh, move on because it's not a great place to invest themselves. So, um, okay, so let me just go back. Where was I here? Um, okay, so why has the husband done this? And um, it, is this about him? Now, let's say he really has addressed himself in this. Um, well, let's say he hasn't. Let's go with that first. Okay. Well, you don't have control over, over whether someone desires you. As any of you listen to me, you've probably heard me say this. You do have control over your desirability. You have control over your trustworthiness. You have control over whether or not it would be safe and desirable to cozy up to you, open your heart and body up to you or not. And <clears throat> A lot of us, I sometimes say this to clients and they never believe me at first. <laughs> I sometimes say this to my higher desire clients. You want, you don't actually want intimacy. Okay. You want control and you want sexual validation, but you don't want intimacy. And they're like, no, no, I absolutely do. <laughs> okay. And the way that this husband is talking about it, he is saying something to the effect of, I really want to be physically intimate and emotionally vulnerable and connected during sex but she's not able or willing to try for that. And first of all, I, I um, see what he's saying. And, and a lot of men, and I don't mean it's fair to just put this on men or say this is just about men, but this, the, the, the way that you can express and receive love through physical intimacy can be profoundly meaningful and isn't necessarily preconditioned on emotional intimacy first and then physical intimacy. That sounds, it's not quite the way I want to say it, but a lot of people feel like I need to know that we are emotionally intimate, then I'm willing to be physically intimate with you. It is another medium of communication and a very powerful one to communicate love and receive love within a relationship. Now, of course, if you're using sex to paper over things, that's a different meaning, okay? But, um, and so this husband is saying, I want to be able to communicate love and receive love in this way. And I'm sure he's, he does. But I think that many of us want the control or the sense of sexual validation of getting someone to be sexual with us rather than intimacy because intimacy is I'm willing to know why you don't desire me. I'm willing to understand what is going on with you. I want to actually know you, not in as much as it reinforces me, but I want to actually know you and how you operate, even in the places that panic me, okay? Because they don't revolve around me or don't necessarily assure me that I'm going to get the things that I want from this marriage, but I'm still willing to know you and be knowable to you. And that's much scarier stuff. I mean, we seldom uh, find that to be so easy and comfortable, usually we're wanting our spouse to reassure us that we're sufficient and adequate and sexually desirable. And we're looking more for that than we're looking to really uh, be seen for the good and for ill. And so <clears throat> a lot of people, and, and so this speaks to, sorry, these aren't easy questions, but uh, I, I've never been good at the 10 tips <laughs> for a better sex life, okay? So I'm probably not going to get hired by Cosmo anytime soon, but there is, so, so for this, okay, sorry, let me just get back to my, my point here. Give me a second. Um, so I think that for this husband, he um, wants to look at why is he taking duty sex? Because does he think that's all he can get? Is he prioritizing control over being desired? Because anytime he says yes to duty sex, um, he is saying, you don't have to choose me. You don't have to give me any better than this. Now he may complain and whine about not getting better and resent about not getting better, but he's complicit in not getting any better than this. So let me just go to this question. He says, I know duty sex is not really beneficial for either spouse. True, okay. This is a humiliation to both people in a way. 
right? You're saying, I'm willing to be tolerated. Now, that is a statement to your wife about yourself. It's also a statement to her about how much you want to really be with her as opposed to be sexu sexually being propped up. And so you say you feel guilty and selfish. Um, yeah, okay, I'll take it in the sense that you feel like, I know I'm kind of just using her to get something to prop me up, but I also think it's self-devaluing. Um, and so um, the, the questioner goes on to say, should I just forget about sex and hope someday that things will change? It's not so much forgetting about sex and hoping things will change. It's basically saying, I don't have control over anybody else loving me. I never will. Uh, but I do have control over how I participate in my relationships. And I'm doing it in a way that's bad for her and bad for me. And if I really want to be chosen, I need to operate like somebody who is choosable and wants to be chosen, insists on being chosen, okay? Uh, because otherwise, I'm a part of the problem, and it's not poor me. It's that I'm, I'm doing something that we're going to run this marriage from a place of validation, exchange, and safety, as opposed to a choice-based marriage. So um, this person goes on to say, we see a female sex therapist who's trying to challenge my wife without much success. Well, what I would say is the wife doesn't need to be challenged. She can, she's pulling this off in the frame that feels safe enough for her. Accommodate him once in a while, feel like I've done my job. I don't really want to open up to him or take the risk of choosing him and loving him and or addressing what's getting in my way around that relative to his behavior, who he is, my anxieties about sex and intimacy, <clears throat> because he's taking it as it is. And now you've got the therapist fighting for you, but you're not actually operating from a position that pushes your wife to sort out who she wants to be and keeps you from having to grow yourself up as well. Um, and you're, we have an agreement that I can masturbate without porn, but that's not fulfilling. Uh, when it's the main source of sexual relief, because because release, because yes. Uh, most people, it's not they don't. It's not orgasms that they're after. They're they want to be wanted. They want to be chosen. Um, the person goes on to say, "I've tried to share JFF materials and other similar materials, but she's not ready and says she may not be for years, if ever." Exactly. This is not an issue of time. This is an issue of it's operating well enough. I'm not saying your wife loves this. I'm sure she doesn't. I'm saying it's operating well enough in the current dynamic. And she's being honest. Um, I may never want to deal with any of this. <laughs> okay. So, good. and so I think then the question is, uh, why don't you want to ever deal with it? And what's my role as a husband in this? Um, and you say, I don't want to be selfish about sex. I want it to be something special and connecting. And I think in order for you to achieve that, you have to be willing to stand up for better, which is going to mean not accepting what's less than uh, fully chosen sexuality. Now that's different than your wife coming in with full passion the next time you have sex, okay? But it's, it is about two people choosing to create something better. Now that may mean dealing with more explicitly the dynamic in the marriage, the issue of the infidelity, uh, the issue of how sex has typically gone to be revolving around what the husband wants, I'm, again, I'm not making the wife a victim in that, but the, that you've been complicit as a couple in creating it that way. So creating something that's more choice, cho sorry, choice based and mutual is going to mean growth for both of you. But every time the husband goes in and accepts duty sex resentfully, he makes certain, or the higher desire person, if you're the woman that's the higher desire one, you make certain that you keep that dynamic the same. Now, this is different than I'm not going to have sex and I'm going to uh, I'm gonna sit around smoldering and angry and make you pay for this, <laughs> okay, because you don't desire me like I deserve. That's not the right position. That's still about trying to get control. That's still about trying to shame the other person, 
It's just the same as using the the uh, fake news. <laughs> I shouldn't use that phrase, but using you know that um, doctored image. It's that same idea of I'm going to pressure and coerce you into choosing me. Well, guess what? Even if they show up and act excited, you know that this is just about coercing your spouse into the same thing and they know it too. This is about taking a more self-respecting position. It might sound something like, <clears throat> I, here's how I've been a part of our bad dynamic, okay? And it's a dynamic that's bad for me and it's bad for you. And I would like to know more about how you have seen sex with me as being undesirable. What do you think my role is in that? Um, and that I, and, I'm, and you're willing to take in and address and think about what your spouse is saying. Um, I'm going to answer your question in a second. Um, and so, yeah, so how am I participating in the problem? And then if you're really addressing your problem, you could say, I am not going to pressure you anymore around this. I'm not going to make it about managing my ego. And, but if I, if we have a sexual relationship, I want it to be one where the two of us are choosing to create something that works for us, not just me anymore, not just about my sexual validation. So let me just see what I said here. Um, how can I desire sex when I'm made to feel like if I don't, I'm glad you're asking this question. I can already tell it's going in the right direction. How can I desire sex when I'm made to feel like if I don't, he will be angry, treat me poorly, and look at porn? Okay, there you go, exactly. How can I learn to enjoy and desire something that causes me so much pain and anxiety? Okay, I'm really glad you're asking this question because it's the counterpoint and I wanna uh, talk to, about that piece because this is the idea of the sort of second hypothesis, hypothesis that I started with, which is, um, you know, if I don't like sex out of good judgment, okay, meaning you make it all about you. If I don't come and prop up your ego, um, that you will basically make me pay for this. And, okay, I'll come to you to, in a second. So, uh, sorry, I'm going to go back here. Um, so... Yeah, so if a spouse is making it so toxic that if you don't go in and manage their sense of self through accommodating them, clearly they're participating and not being chosen, okay? And what I would say to that person, to the wife in this situation, is that in order to create a choice-based marriage, you have to deal straight up with how unchoosable your spouse is. And so it's, you're staying invested in creating, this is not about the goal is having sex. The goal is, is creating a collaborative marriage and an intimate marriage where you can tolerate being knowable, dealing with your limitations, dealing with where it's hard to be close to your spouse, either because of what you're doing or what your spouse is doing, and you're addressing those issues to make them better. So a way of choosing your spouse in that situation is not you go have sex with them because you know they're gonna punish you if not. It would be to address honestly with them you're impossible to choose because you make it so uh, toxic if I don't choose you that it's never going to be a choice with you. And because you want it to go the way that reinforces you, you will have no interest in knowing me. Right? It's hard to have sex with a demanding narcissistic person. <laughs> And certainly you don't want to be intimate with that person because it's always about how it reinforces them. So again, this is not the Cosmo version. This is about addressing and my Enhancing Sexual Intimacy course helps couples to do this, to really look at what's the fundamental dynamic that's happening between this couple that sexual intimacy is so um, unlikely to happen. Uh, what is operating in either person and how are they contributing to this frustrating dynamic? So the person that is out of good judgment, not interested in sex, the way sh she or he is choosing the marriage is stepping up and naming and addressing that and saying, I want to have good sex with you. I want to be comfortable being close to you, but you are doing things in a way that being close to you is uh, impossible to desire from my wise self 
And so I do it to manage you. But you always feel managed because you are. And I always feel resentful. And this is bad for me to participate in with you. Now, your higher desire spouse is not going to like that and not going to tell you you're so right and how could they be so dumb. Probably it's going to be more about, you know, you're wrong and you're not fair and you've never liked sex. And there's going to be a lot of maybe even pushing on some things that are true as a way to get away from the core issue. So, um, so this is not again, about having sex necessarily, but dealing with what's interfering with good sex and your desire and what needs to be addressed in one or both of you for that to be more likely. Tyler says, you almost addressed it, but went another direction. Please address what to do, assuming the husband has addressed his losing strategies and is actually a desirable person. Okay, good. And it would be a good choice for his wife to choose him. Um, okay, good. So what I would say to that is, let me just think how to, well, I would definitely say if that's really clear, now I, I would probably want to go still clear that with my wife. I mean, not that she's going to necessarily tell you, but I would still say, what do you think interferes at this point? And what, is there something I'm missing? Okay, because there may be. What makes it hard to be with me? Now, let's say that what is hard is not about you and who you are let's say it's about you are in fact strong and your wife hasn't developed herself enough to want to be knowable and doesn't want to deal with her sexuality and her sexual anxieties and her intimacy issues and so on and so she's hoping she can just keep you hoping that this will get better when she doesn't really have any desire to address it or change it um <clears throat> then i you, you know, it's about seeing that if that's in fact the case and learning how to, this will push you to be more able to self-regulate. Now, I've worked with some couples where they're like, you know, she's never going to choose me and, I, you know, I don't think that's ever going to happen. And they get some sense of relief from that in the idea that they're going to get out of the marriage. So the reason they self-regulate by the idea that they're going to leave the marriage and I'm not saying that some people might not leave a marriage in which they're not getting chosen, but I wouldn't use the idea of I'm out to try to self-regulate because it's a false self-regulation. It's learning how to manage oneself in the face of a spouse's choice and learn how to more deeply be able to hold their sense of dignity, their sense of desirability, their sense of value without being in a position of contempt and hostility and control, but controlling themselves in the face of that. So this is really important because this is not about what you say or what you do. It's about developing a muscle inside yourself that gets you more able to tolerate invalidation and still function productively without going into a position of trying to get the other person to do something to make you feel better. And this is especially important because if, in this case, a wife is tracking the husband starting to get a little more of a spine around this, is starting to question his role, she may well do just enough to keep it in the position that she knows how to do this without having to confront her own growth. And so you, you need to really get clear in yourself about um, if you can self regulate in the face of the other person's invalidation and you'll know if it's more internal more deeply connected to yourself finding your own strength and clarity in the face of the spouse's choices and behavior and it's not fixated or focused on the spouse herself or himself if you're the woman in the higher desire person so you are more able to handle your dignity and then address it in that sense. So it might sound like this if somebody has really done that work, which is, I know I've been a part of our challenges. I know that I have participated in A, B, and C ways. I also know that I have, out of my own fear and anxiety, been willing to tolerate being accommodated, tolerated, but not chosen. And I'm not willing to do that to myself anymore, or you for that matter. 
I'm not willing to participate with you in that dynamic anymore. And I love you. You're my first choice. I want to be wanted by you. But that's not something I can control. That's not something I can make happen. And I'm going to stop pretending I can. And if you don't choose me, and you don't have to, uh, then I'll you know sort out what I'm going to do in my life that I can live with and feel good about. But I don't want to pretend anymore that that's in my control beyond dealing with how I may be easy to not choose. So, okay, let me just see what else. Um, this person says, how are you supposed to deal with wanting to have more sex than your spouse because you have an anxious atta attachment? I feel like that is how I feel my spouse's love. He's affectionate, though. I just crave his constant affection. Okay, good. So I think um, what you're speaking to here is that this is desire driven by the difficulty with self-regulation, not desire for another person, right? And again, David Schnarch talks about this a lot, this idea. So this is not, this is about the seeking of, I want you to love me. I want to be clear that you find me sufficient, or I want the IV drip of validation through sex and affection that uh, is a replacement, it doesn't work, but a, a replacement for learning to internally validate. And, you know, my golden retriever definitely has this issue. <laughs> I can pet him and pet him and as soon as I stop, he puts his paw on me because he wants more. He has a hard time regulating his sense of self, but many humans have the same challenge. And the way that you learn to do it is really quite maybe as unsatisfying of an answer as this is, you learn to do it by doing it, by saying, I'm not going to go and get this person to settle my anxiety in the way I know I can get it from, like guilt them, I can make them feel that I feel bad, I can, I can, I can express my disappointment in them. There's lots of ways that we push each other for the validation we want, but while it may feel normal and the person on the other side gets dysregulated by your unhappiness with them, that even though it's easy to do it, it keeps you both weak. And so I talk about this in the Strengthening Your Relationship course. I talk about this moment where I couldn't get my husband's validation. It's just one picture. But instead of going after it through judgment and pressure, I instead pulled myself away, self-confronted, and tried to calm myself down, hold on to my sense of dignity, my sense of self, tolerated that he has other choices than just propping me up, and, and to find my ability to sustain myself in a deeper way. Now, it feels like a small thing. There's, you know, how do you prove it to anybody? But something's growing inside and it makes you stronger as an individual and it makes you stronger as a couple because now your spouse is choosing you not because they're trying to still manage this vulnerability and anxiety in you. They're choosing you because you're choosable and you're sustaining yourself. In really good sex, it's two people that can take responsibility for themselves, take responsibility for their sexuality and their sense of self and really share themselves with one another. It's not about caretaking. Good sex is never about caretaking. And I don't mean to say that your spouse is having a hard time and you're not that much in the mood for sex. You couldn't, in a sense, like be there for them sexually as a way of loving them and caretaking them. But th that's like the blip on this screen in the bigger experience. And, um, and you know, isn't about trying to... Um, um, manage another person's sense of self chronically. Okay, so I'm going to take maybe just a couple more questions and then we'll stop. Uh, so he says, what are, what, I think, what are the common core issues that couples often need to deal with and who do they do this, how do they do this together? I think what you're asking, um, again, is, is very much in the two couples courses, which is what are these common core dynamics that emerge within couples that are happening, they're both participating in them, they're familiar to both people, and yet they're invisible because they're so familiar, but they're eroding any real desire and eroding intimacy. 
And so let me see if I can give you an example of maybe one or two. I think a common one is the pursuer distancer dynamic, for example. So you have one person who's doing all the wanting um, and the person who um, is in response, one person who desires and uh, wants and the other person, one person who chooses and the other is chosen. That's a common dynamic. Now the chooser sometimes is doing it out of strength, sometimes is doing it out of their own need for validation of the other person. So they stay in pursuit of people that don't actually choose them back. There's it's like, I want to know uh, that you will choose me, that will validate my desirability and manage something in me, but um, I'm not even really thinking about if you're the, a good person for me, or um, uh, let's see, you know, it's not even about intimacy, it's not about being knowable to you or known, I just want to conquer and get this. And the person that is in the pursued position likes the validation of being wanted, but they don't have to actually choose or be exposed in it. That would be a common dynamic that happens in couples. Um, there's a lot of variations on that theme, but let me see. You know, another version is the demanding or explosive spouse and then the accommodating spouse. So the accommodator resents, but can't handle their sense of self well when the other person gets so upset and that can be upset through anger or upset through depression but you know you have this person that goes in and will manage and mitigate and try and handle the self of the more volatile one and then this becomes like you know i'm needy and i need to be needed and so that's a, a locked in dynamic that manages the questions of self in a deeply unsatisfactory way but satisfactory enough that people keep doing it, but it's not really about deeper exposure and intimacy. So, you know, as I say a lot, you know, we often want uh, validation much more than intimacy. Intimacy is scary. That's I'm willing to know who I am, let you know who I am, and deal with who I am. And I'm an intimacy coach. I talk about it all the time, and I, I still hate it. <laughs> like, I mean, you know, I was learning things about myself lately as a parent that have really sucked to learn, and I, <laughs> I don't like it, and, and yet it's all true. And so it's valuable to learn it. I'm grateful, actually, to be seeing more things about myself that I've been previously blind to. It's good for me and good for my relationships. But it never feels good. It's never fun. We all want the fantasy that we're doing just great and other people need to grow up, not us. <laughs> uh, it's never true. Okay, um, let's see. Let me just take the next two and then I'll stop. Um, okay, so what signs or questions indicate the unchosen partner is headed in the right direction? Um, or am I just looking for replacement validation source? Well, no, you're not. Well, you might be, but let me just give you a couple answers to that. I think. A signal that you're headed in the right direction is you can feel that you're unhooking. And not that you're becoming unconcerned. It's not like a resentful withdrawal. But you're not feeling as run around by the responses of your partner as much as you used to be. You're more able to see and track it and not care less necessarily. It's not that you're like, oh, I don't care about you. It's not resentment distance. It's like, I do care about you, but I can see what you're doing. I can see where you're struggling and I can still sustain my sense of self. I can still be in a conversation with you about what's going on with you or even see myself and steady myself in the face of your difficulty or any more feedback to me. So you can feel this deeper anchor happening. You feel less reactive, less like you need to control or manage the picture, less need to control the spouse, and more ability to regulate yourself. Now I think this leads right into the next question of what does it mean to self-regulate in the face of a spouse's invalidation? Okay, good. You're asking a very reasonable question <laughs> and it has a lot to do with how I teach these things and so People who have taken the courses will better understand these basic principles, but this is, you know, a lot of my work is based in differentiation theory that uh, Murray Bowen taught uh, a few decades ago. David Schnarch does a lot of work with, and this is the idea simply that 
human beings as they grow in their psychological and relational development grow into deeper ability to manage their own sense of self without being propped up, approved of, told they're sufficient by the people around them. And we as babies and children are dependent upon validation. It's the way we learn a self is to gather a sense of who we are through how people are in relationship to us. And this is how the brain develops is in these dynamics. Uh, the healthier those dynamics are, the easier it is to grow into a more autonomous self uh, that is unique and, and expressing herself or himself uniquely in the world without constant validation and can handle the sense of knowing that they're sufficient and valuable and beloved by God and so on without other people managing that for them. And people that are parented less well are more likely to continue to look for people to manage their sense of self, tell them they're enough, prop, thing, prop up their minds through agreeing with them, um, managing their sexuality. We can do it in two different ways, and I talk about this a lot more in the courses, but you can do it through um, being what will make your spouse happy with you, so accommodation, I'll be whatever you want, just love me. Or people can do it through pressuring others to conform to them, like just want what I want, have sex with me when I want you to have it, you know, like the same things I like, believe as I believe. Um, and if you do, everything will be a lot better and uh, I'll be happier, you'll be happier. <laughs> okay. The third way is that you keep distance in the relationship. You don't let somebody matter too much to you. So uh, th this fundamentally human tendency is very easy to play out in our most important relationships. And that's why marriage is a divine institution because, and, and parenting for that matter, is it teaches you, if you'll let it, a lot about who you are and where you struggle with these issues. And so my courses are designed to help you see where your pursuit of this and your difficulty with self-regulation is undermining your happiness in your life, undermining your self-respect, and undermining your capacity for intimacy in your marriage. Okay, just because I am uh, out of time. I need to stop, but there's lots of great questions here. And um, I hope you all have benefit from, benefited from it. And if you're in the group and you, you know, have more questions coming out of this, feel free to ask them. Other group members have lots of great insight, particularly people that have followed my work. And I sometimes get in there and answer some questions too. So I hope this gives you at least a starting point for thinking about some of these challenges. And uh, stay safe, keep washing your hands, and um, and we'll get through this. Okay, bye everybody.